the dedicated few are here, or are you the ones that have no place to go? <laughs> well, I'm glad you're here. It'll just solidify better. We'll do some more with color. It's one of my favorite shirts. What do we call these colors? The yeah, the primary colors of light, because do they add or subtract? They add together. See, all three of them overlap together makes white. And what do we call these? Yeah, the secondary and subtractive. Some people refer to these as the primary of pigments. And that's fine. But I want you to realize that they're subtracting light out by filtering it. Um, let's start with all those. Get them in our head, because I'm going to want you to know this. So, if you have white light, that's what three colors? Added together, what three colors? Red, blue, and green. This is kind of like my table of shortcut of, of this picture. All right, what do red and blue make? Magenta, and since that might be a new word for some of you, I'll write that one out. Red and green. Yellow. Blue and green. Cyan. I might as well be complete here. So it's kind of like a short code there. So these are like not, when you learn in school, like if you make, you know, how to mix colors, if you like paint the different colors, this is not. This is not what you learn in school, mixing colors, yeah. Uh, I, I st did a little bit of that last time. I'll finish my chart and show you how that works again. Um, So, what would happen if you mix magenta with green? Use your reasoning skills. White? How do you get white? You're absolutely right. That was just my pause delay to let everybody think about it. Yeah, magenta is red and blue. You add green, and you get white. So what do we need to add to yellow? Yeah, to get white, sorry. What, what two are yellow? The yellow is red and green, so if we add blue, we get white. And once we cyan, we would need... Cyan is which two colors? Blue and green, so we need to add red. So you, those three would all make white. Combina those combinations. You could uh, do magenta and cyan. What are you going to get? Magenta is red and blue. Cyan is blue and green, so all three of them are in there. You'll, you'll get white, but it might have a bluish tint because it's stronger. If they're all this, 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 by the way, is when they're all the same intensity. What do you get if it was 50% red, 50%? Let's write that down. Half red. Yeah, that doesn't make sense when you look at it later. 50% red, so it's not, it's half as intense. I don't know, how, what best way? To, there's less of it. <laughs> less intense. What do you get? Right. Gray. 
And take your pick. I don't know, E or A. <laughs> yeah, because if you got rid of all three, if it was 0% of each, you'd end up with black. So that's a bunch of adding together scenarios. So that's the additive colors. Let's do the subtractive as a review. My backside. Cyan plus magenta plus yellow. Now this isn't the light now. These are, these are pigments, filters. Crayons, inks, whatever it makes you remember it. You're right, black. Because they're going to filter every single one. If you had cyan plus yellow, what makes it through? You got one vote for green. You guys agree with that? What the cyan let through? If you had a cyan filter, what color would it look? Okay, if you're thinking really hard about this, you're, you're, you're making it too difficult. If you're looking at a cyan filter, what color does it look? Cyan. You know, think about it. I'm holding, remember my transparency slide? If it was cyan, it looks cyan. Why does it look cyan? Yeah, it filters everything but cyan. So it lets what two colors pass through it? Blue and green. So a cyan filter or cyan ink or a cyan crayon lets blue and green through it. That's why it looks cyan. So what color is it blocking? Red. So this blocks red. It's like not red. <laughs> I don't know how you want to do it that way. What does yellow block? Blue. Not blue. So what makes it through? Just the green. Because red gets blocked here, blue gets blocked there, but green can get through both of them. See, blue-green, red-green. So the green can make it through. So, if you, are, if you take uh, you know, your yellow and, and quote-unquote blue crayon, yellow and blue make Yellow and blue make green. You probably learned that as a kid. It's just now, to make a pure green, that blue would be cyan. Because really this, to have a pure green is cyan. I mean, when you're a little kid and you look at cyan, I mean, if I just showed you this color, what color would you say it is? A light blue. <laughs> And that works as a kid. But, you know, that's okay. Now, say you take a crayon, though, and it looks darker, and it looks like this, as, a, as a inks. And you mix that with yellow ink. What's the main color that's going to get through? It's going to look green. It just won't be this pure green. It'll be a little bluer. But you'll, all kids would still call it green. Same idea with magenta. Let's see, if you mix, um, yeah, red and blue make, with crayons, purple. All right, now let's think about that. Really, to get a, whoops, magenta, and cyan. Let's see, if we mixed magenta with cyan, what would we get? Precisely, we wouldn't get purple. Magenta blocks which color? Right, that's not green. And cyan is 
not red. So the color that makes it through is blue. Now this is reality, precise, pure colors. Just for a reference point. Now if you're a little kid and you look at magenta and cyan, you just, let's mix this and this. Red and blue. Yeah, it's going to look purplish because you're using red, not magenta. And you're using blue, not cyan. So you got a little more blue and a little more red. The, a lot of red's blocked. So it's going to look bluer. It'll be a, a blue-purple when you mix those crayons. I mean, go home and try it. You can take your markers or whatnot. Yes, it won't be a pure blue. It'll be more purple. Of course, you're starting with blue, you're adding a little red. My, my point is, as a kid, just trying to, the stuff you probably relate to, red and blue make purple. This is why. Does it make sense? They're subtracting and filtering out the colors. All right. Let's, uh, I prepared a few clicker questions. Um, stuff we've already covered. So we can practice. All right. There's the uh, channel number, the session ID number, the first qu Oh, they're not projecting. Sorry. Stop it. PowerPoint. That button. All right, there we go. Now you can see the numbers. Sorry about that. So this first one, visible light that shines on a pane of transparent glass does what through the glass? What's it do when it gets to the glass? We've discussed this a few times. Whole section in your book on it. Let's see who ha who's got it. I know you're trying to think, but you know I stall more on the first question. So friendly reminder, um, no class Friday, obviously. Monday of next week, we will mostly wrap things up with chapter 29. It's listed on the calendar. Uh, in a week, next Wednesday, is review. We're almost done with all this material. So next Wednesday we'll review, which means your last exam, exam four of the midterm, is next Friday. So a week and a half. So the week we come back, you'll have that exam at the end of the week. The last week of classes, Monday and Wednesday, we'll review everything. And again, your final is on December 13th at 1030 before our class normally starts. So that's all listed, in case you can't remember. Get that in your brains. All right, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. 100 percent A! Everybody got it. Well, no explanation there. Great. That's awesome. Uh, let's try this one then. The slowing of light in a transparent material such as the glass has to do with what? Are these as easy as you were hoping, Tina? <laughs>
10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Ooh, 91% A. Very good. That's what delays it. It's those interactions with the molecules. They get absorbed and then re-emitted. Absorbed and re-emitted. And that delays how long it takes to get through it. Not always. Density can affect it, but it's, it's not the density of the objects that slows it down. It's the absorption and re-emission with each of them. It is related. It's there as a distractor. <laughs> yeah, because I, I don't know if you remember last period lecture, I, I said if it's more optically dense, A is going to happen, and it will slow it down. But there are a few materials where they can be more optically dense, but not more dense like we've been taught, or vice versa. So it's still those interactions that are key. There are actually a few materials that people have made, scientists mostly, where it can actually go faster, relatively speaking. Uh, they're weird. You can Google them. <laughs> okay. Color of light that best passes through violet glass is which of those? One of those answers it by far the best. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Most of you, D. There again, if you got this wrong, you may be overly cautious. If you're paying attention, I, I gave that one to you. If it's, if it's violet glass, it looks violet. That means violet light gets through it. That's why we see violet. So don't, you know, it's, there is some common sense to this. We're not trying to trick you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Open back up for you that are still here. Vote again. It's a freebie. <laughs> 10, 9, Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> Anybody willing to share that still thinks red? Okay. Correct answer is still violet. All right. You can put your clickers away. Do you remember what I told you about um, if you were invisible? What would have to happen? Yeah. If I couldn't see you, then that means light is not refracting as it goes through your eyeball, or I could detect that it was there because it would get bent. So it can't bend when it goes into your eyeball either. So you'd be blind. How many of you have seen those... Uh, Bitwads, those spitballs, those balls that start out really small, like this big, like little BBs. You put them in your water and they swell up. They can absorb like 300% the, the times their uh, weight in water. That pretty much means they're 99.9% .9 water. So if you put them in water, the speed of light is the same in water. And when it transitions into one of these spheres, 
It's in water. See all the spheres? They're invisible. Can you see the spheres? How do you know I'm not tricking you? Let's let the water drain out. I got a little mesh cloth here, so I'm just... There they are. Yeah, if you're close enough, you can barely see it. And again, it's because what causes refraction? It changes medium. Thus, the light does what? How does it react? It, it bends because those light waves are doing something. They're changing velocity. They're speeding up or slowing down. And it's because they travel at different speeds in the two materials that it bends. It's the change in velocity between the materials that causes refraction. So if they travel the same speed or nearly darn close to the same speed, then watch. Light, water goes back in. And like magic, poof, it disappears. I have some in this jar too. You can pour out some of the water. Get, get some of them. There they are. They kind of bounce. Boing. They're fun. If you let them dry out, it'll take days. They'll shrivel back up and you can reuse them. But there they are. But in water, disappear. My daughter's favorite thing to do is just chuck it against the wall. Because it just kind of shatters. <laughs> we'll do another one. Because it is fun. They just go everywhere. But neat little demo to emphasize that speed the stuff again. Here's another one. You've seen it before. Remember our happy sad balls? One bounces, one doesn't. Which one's happy? We started out saying this one was happy. But in reality, this one's happier. Why? We'll review. Because it doesn't bounce, but why does that make it happier? It feels less force. Remember, they, they come in with the same momentum, mass times velocity, same mass, drop from the same height, same speed, right there. So they come in with the same momentum. They both stop. They both have the same change in momentum. But there's an extra change for the one that bounces and gets kicked back up. So there's extra force on the one that bounces. Ideally, it's twice the force. <laughs> It, it actually ends up having twice the change in momentum. The momentum to stop and the momentum to kick it back up. Another word for change in momentum is? Impulse. Impulse, that's right. Impulse was force times time. It's that force over time, for a duration of time, that creates that change in velocity and momentum. So yeah, this one's happy. I brought them out just to reemphasize uh, if these are like uh, waves, light that comes in. Now we're thinking of light as a particle, a photon of light. comes in and interacts with a material like the, the, the table. What would be the two scenarios of, for this object? For the two, this one versus this one. What's that tell us about the object? If these are light waves that come in or particles, one bounces back, what do we call that? A reflection. And this one, absorption. So what's that tell us about the material for the two cases? Yeah, this would be like a mirror. Maybe metals with outer electrons not bound. What are the electrons doing when this comes in? Yeah, just like this squishes. It absorbs the energy, but then spits it right back out. What's this one doing? Very good. It's getting absorbed. So these come in with certain frequencies. This frequency vibrates the electrons, but they don't like it and kick it back out. This one vibrates the electrons or atoms and does what? They like it. What do we call that phenomenon? Where the driving frequency, the frequency of the light, resonates with the natural, uh, natural vibrating frequency of the material. So this gets absorbed. For example, 
this pigment is absorbing which two wavelengths or frequencies of light? Right, red and green. So if this was a red particle and it came in and hit my blue shirt, it just got absorbed. This is now what color? Blue. It absorbs it but spits it back out and you reflects off of it and you see it. Stay. Okay. We talked about sunsets in the sky. Do you remember that? You got white light coming from the sun. And what's it do when it hits the particles in the sky? It does refract. It also scatters. Because it bends because it changes mediums from vacuum into the space. So it bends because the speed changes. But then it hits all these particles. And the, the wavelengths that are the shortest, which side of the spectrum is that? Violet and blue end have the shorter wavelengths, high, faster frequencies, more energy. They interact with the smaller particles in the, in the um, atmosphere better, and they get scattered more than the long waves of red. The long waves pass through. Remember it was that way with sound? Which waves, what frequencies go further with sound waves? Lower frequencies. Because they're interacting less often. They have bigger waves. Remember, it's those interactions uses up the energy. It's a similar game here. The ones with a lot of energy and short waves, little fast frequency like blue and violet interact more, and they get scattered for the size of those particles. So the blue gets scattered, and the sky looks blue to us. Eventually, that, all that scattered blue light comes back to our eye. And, hey, the you know, sky's blue. But the sun now has blue subtracted from it. We're left with red and green, which is why the sun looks yellow. Let's scatter some more blue out, maybe into the green. Go through more material, more atmosphere, lower on the sky. And now you get rid of blue and green, you're just left with red. Sunsets. Uh, the clouds I mentioned. Anybody remember why they're white? So this is clouds, tiny, we'll call it medium, no large, huge, and hue, whoops, humongous. What do you think this scatters? There you go, blue and violet. And this one? Green. And this one? Red. So since a cloud looks white, it's made up of tiny, medium, and large droplets. They're all different sizes. Wouldn't that be cool one day if you looked up, though, and the cloud was this red? The whole thing was red? Then you would know it's all, it's all made up of large droplets. There's no tiny and small and medium ones. That'd be cool, but I've never seen that. <laughs> In theory, we could make an artificial cloud of, of large droplets, all the same size. If you shine white light on it, you now know what color it will look. Because it will scatter to the red. Back to your eye. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I still remember one day. It was pretty much straight overhead. It was a little cockeyed. It was like you drew a line. Like it was that definitive, that sharp, right down from one, at horizon to horizon. <laughs> this side was blue sky, fluffy white clouds. And this side, the whole thing was full, ominous, dark green. Yes, the, the, a tornado came that day. Uh, yeah, that tells us something then. Yeah, well, it was. That's why I used the word ominous. <laughs> um, just so you know, clouds can look other colors. They look if they absorb the colors, it can look gray. 
And the bigger the droplets get, they accumulate and accumulate and accumulate. They get bigger and bigger. And once they get the huge, I know this is all relative. But, uh, it, it's, it looks like a rain cloud. Now you know how big they are, roughly, at least compared to wavelengths of light. Yeah, it's absorbing most of these. And so less is coming to you, and it looks grayer and grayer and darker and darker. And so when they're black, oh man. So ominous dark green, it must have had a bunch of these. There was some blue in there. I mean some red. But And what happens if they get really, really, really big? Humongous. But you know what happens? It rains. <laughs> They're so big, their weight has increased, and the, and the updrafts can't hold it up anymore. Remember, it's just balance of forces. If, if uh, the updraft can't hold the humongous drop, it's too heavy, it falls out, and it rains. All right. Who has brown eyes? Raise your hand. Oh, I would have thought there's more. Who has blue eyes? About equal. Green? A few of those. What do the rest of you have? Some men. Hazel? Well, what's the remainder? Remainders? Yellow. Who's a demon? No. Gray. Gray. Who has two different colors? No, okay. Well, uh, this... We can explain this phenomenon with this color. It's the mixing. Brown. It's a pigment in there. It's subtractive. So if they're brown, what's going on? Now, I didn't do that one. When we don't have brown up here. But I bet you can guess it's less intense. Yeah, do you remember? I did do yellow. And when I decreased red, it became orange. What if we just made the orange a little darker? Let's get rid of some of the green, too. It would become brown. So brown is uh, mostly red and green. Yeah, they, it's like they have yellow eyes, but they're darker. So basically, the pigment in, in your brown eyes is absorbing the blue. And some red and green. But mo it's absorbing all the blue. So no blue come, reflects back out. Just red and green reflect back out, some. And so they look brown. It's the pigment in your eye. Blue, blue eyes. It's not as much the pigment. It's, yeah, they're usually kind of a cyan. It's not like that deep blue. And it's more about scattering. There's particles in your eye that are small and they scatter the blue. So that it comes back out. So it's not scattering the, the um, green and red. Those are getting absorbed. Green, it's a mix of those two phenomena. Partially due to scattering and some due to absorbing. But we know that either through absorbing or scattering, if we see green, red and blue are getting taken out, subtracted from the white spectrum. Cool. What color is water? You're like, it's clear, you dummy. <laughs> Duh. Was it, but you look at lakes. Well, there's particles in there that might, might be doing stuff. If you have pure water and you get enough of it so that you're looking through a lot of it, yeah, it actually has a light blue tint due to some scattering again. I find it interesting. I wrote that down. It's the only known example of a natural color caused by vibrational transitions. Maybe you don't care, but I thought it was cool. It's the water molecules. You know, you got an oxygen. Let's say that's me, and my fists are hydrogen. The bonds, the, co co uh, the uh, oxygen-hydrogen bonds are strong, and these are light. So the vibration here is really high because it's stiff. Like tightening a guitar string, it makes the frequency higher. And that fr natural frequency matches um, to make water look blue. Just, it's the only known example of a natural color caused by a vibrational transition. Usually it's the, it vibrates with the atoms themselves or the electrons, but this one's for the water molecule itself. 
I find that cool. So in nature, you'll see all kinds of colors. And now you can at least, you might not know exactly what does the subtracting and adding, but you should know what colors are getting subtracted and adding. Because if you see something that's cyan, then I know blue and green light's getting to your eye. Red's being taken out one way or another through absorption, through scattering, through interference. We're getting there. Let's do rainbows. Because rainbows are pretty. Uh, you know what? I, 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 I used to try to draw these. I'm not too bad, but I, I found some pictures to make it better. So remember with a prism, I shown shined, shown, shined. <laughs> just kidding. White light through a prism, it changes speed, it refracts. Blue is interacting more frequently because it has the higher frequency, so it refracts more. Do you see that? Blue is getting bent more. Then it refracts again when it exits the prism, and you can spread out the colors. That's called dispersion. Dispersion, when you spread them out like that. We did it over here last lecture. Well, that's what a water droplet does. It acts like a prism. The sunlight comes in from above. There's the rays. And they refract right here. And they disperse. You get red and blue. Some light actually reflects off this surface. But not as much that it goes through, because you know water is transparent. Well... Some reflects off the back surface as it tries to transition back into air. Some actually does refract through, and we lose that. This is why rainbows aren't really, really, really intensely bright. But that reflected light then comes back, and it refracts. Yes, there's reflected light there too. And we get even more dispersion. You can follow the red ray here. That's the top one. It gets bent less, reflects, Refracts. So it, two refractions here and here, and one reflection. That's how you get the colors of a rainbow. The way it works is you're down here, your eyeball looking back up at it. So the sun has to be behind you. You're standing here where my cursor is, looking to the right. That means the sun's behind you. The light comes in. Refracts, reflects, refracts, spreads out those lights, those colors, and they enter your eyeball. Now, if I'm standing right where the cursor is, what color am I going to see from that water droplet? I'm going to see the violet. Wait, wait, wait. I'll make it more obvious. If I'm standing right here, I see violet. If I go like this with my head, just shift over to here, from that droplet, I see red. It's actually a bunch of droplets. Here's like two of them. See the eyeball over here? This eyeball, or water droplet, sends red to my eye. This water droplet sends violet to my eye. So what does my brain think? It traces these rays back. It thinks the red came from over here somewhere. And it looks like the violet came along this direction over here. And you get a rainbow. And you see red on the top and violet on the bottom. But there are, there are hordes of water molecules out there, each one sending you a different color. But they go all the way around, actually a whole circle in a cone. All of these droplets along follow my cursor are, are sending red to my eye. All of these are sending blue to my eye for that person standing right there. If that person takes one step to the right, it doesn't look like the rainbow moves, but you're actually getting light from completely different water droplets. So when you're standing next to your friend enjoying the beauty of a rainbow, you're not actually seeing the same rainbow. Because it comes from different water droplets. And if you're up in an airplane, you can actually see it all the way around. You don't have the, the earth blocking the bottom half. And I've seen that once in my life. I don't fly a lot. There's a rainbow. There it is. 
Red on the outside, blue on the inside, violet. And again, that's because the violet refracts or bends more. Now, how many of you notice a, the secondary bow? The colors are actually swapped. The red's on the inside and the blue's on the outside. If you've ever noticed that, this is what's happening on a secondary rainbow. The light comes in at the bottom of the water droplet, refracts, reflects twice, and then refracts back out. But that changes the, the sides of the two colors because of that double reflection. That's what's going on in the secondary bow. Since there's an extra reflection, it's usually not as bright. You've lost a little more light. Questions? Actually, let's turn the lights back off. Let's look at, here's a heat lamp. It's a coil of wire, like your space heater or a blow dryer. I'm going to send electricity through it. I'm going to cast a shadow. It's that one, <laughs> the one moving. I'm, it's going to turn on and heat up the air. Which way does hot air go? Hot air rises. Do you think we can see it? Can you normally see it? Well, what should light do when it goes from the cooler air in the room through the hot air above the lamp. This light is coming along. It gets to here. It ought to refract because it changes speed. Well, then we ought to be able to see it. Let's turn on the light bulb. You're watching the screen? Bulb is on. Look at that. Can you see it? Yeah, I can dim them even more. Let's do that one for contrast. You see that? Where it gets lighter and darker? That's because where it's darker, light is being bent away from the screen there. Less light hits the screen there. Because the light bent as it went through the hot. You've seen this, you know, the, the road's hot, or a car is hot, and you see that shimmer above it. That's what's going on. It's the cooler air passing through the warmer air, changing speed and refracting. And so if you're standing here, ah, that just looks like a bright, okay, too much contrast there. But this is a cool way to project it. I love it up there. It's a way to see convection, too. So you see the air circulating. That's awesome. If I disturb the air above it, too, I can kind of... See if it happens if I blow across it. If I cool it, you don't see as much. That's a mirage. This is how mirages work. How many of you have ever seen like the uh, images in the road ahead of you on a hot summer day? That's what's going on. Light from above is being refracted. So you can see me while I do this. It's like you're on the road here. You're in your car. You're happy. And you have another car coming over here. Or we'll just simplify life here. You got a tree. Well, the light from the tree would normally come straight to your eye. That beam, you'd see the top of the tree. The beam that comes along here, you wouldn't see. Unless... A really hot road. So you have cooler air up here and w warm air down here. What will this ray do now? It refracts. And it actually refracts this way. So it comes in here and it, each time it gets into a warmer layer of air, it curves up. It actually bit, literally bends. So where do you think that light ray came from? Right here. And you see a mirage or an image of the tree down there. Have you ever seen the car headlights in the road? Or it looks like a mirror, a wet spot? That's the sky reflecting. The light from the sky is coming in, 
bending, and you see that blue reflected on there. It kind of just looks like a water puddle. But it's, it's more obvious when you have like a tree or car headlights. It's like you, you see, if you're looking at the car, you see that, but in the road in front of it, it's like you see in this water puddle two other lights. It's a mirage. Uh, it travels, light travels faster in hot air. It's at interactions again. Let's slow it down, right? Well, hot air is, is less dense. All those particles are farther apart. So it's easier for the light to get through. So it goes through faster. Does that make sense? Because it always confused me because now, go back to sound. Sound goes faster in hot air also. It's because of the interactions. It, but it needs those interactions. But wait, you just said they're farther apart. But they're hotter. They're moving faster. So they bump into each other more often. And that's how sound propagates. It's a mechanical wave. So sound goes faster in hot air because of the interactions. Because it needs them. Light goes faster in hot air because of the interactions. There's less interactions because they're farther apart. It can get through. It doesn't want them. This, it needs them bouncing around. Does that make sense? That always confused me. But it, it goes faster in both hot air, sound, and light for different reasons. But it's still about the interactions. Sound needs the interactions. It needs the medium. It's because they're interacting with each other more frequently. That's how it gets through. Light, they're, they're farther apart. It doesn't need them to get through. That just slows it down. And so if they're farther apart, it can, it can scooch through. Uh, the reverse can happen on the water. You can see a ship above a ship, upside down. That's a mirage, just with it flipped. Because usually the water is cooler and the warm air inversion. I've never seen that. And I'm not on the ocean much. <laughs> Last one. Uh, so you can all see it. This is a soap bubble. I dipped it in soap solution, pulled it up, and now there's a film of soap in this frame. I'm going to project this so you guys can see it on the screen. Because the colors you see we can explain. There it is. Uh, there. So you've seen the, col the pretty colors in a soap bubble before, right? Well, here's yellow. What do we know? If we're seeing yellow, we're seeing which two colors? Red and green. So what's being subtracted out? Blue. We're going to learn next time that that's through interference. Light reflects off the front surface of the film. Some goes through and bounces off and reflects off the back surface. When those two come back out, they could be in or out of phase, depending on the, the thickness of the film. So you can have constructive and destructive interference. That can add light or subtract light. So if we see yellow, blue is being destructively interfered. How about the magenta? What's being destructively interfered? Green. It takes it out. It's being canceled. And this tells you, since the, I know blue and green have different wavelengths, that tells us the thickness of the film is different in those two places. You actually know exactly how thick it is by the wavelengths of the, those two colors, or at least some multiple of it. There you go. Here, I, I dipped it at the beginning of the lecture. This is starting to look uh, white. All of them are reflecting back. It's so thin right here that none of them are being canceled out. This is actually upside down. I'm projecting it through a lens, and lens flip things. So this is actually the top, and all the soap solutions draining to the bottom. But it's pretty. So next time you see a soap bubble, that's what's going on. Some colors are just being subtracted out. In this case, it's from interference, and I'll explain 
uh, I can draw that on the board better next week. You guys have a great, happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>